don't just consider the local market, consider global, the global market. You have people all over the world open to you to teach to through, through lessons online. Uh, and some of them in, in very wealthy countries and areas that have a lot, uh, lot higher budgets and a lot higher uh, idea of what music lessons are worth. Um, and, and thirdly, there are a lot of other ways to supplement your income besides teaching. You could do you know, group lessons and workshops and retreats and uh, all sorts of different things. You're watching Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast, and this is episode number 41. G'day everyone and welcome to today's show, which is the first in business month on the blog. And this is a really, really important month, in my opinion, uh, in which I help you, hopefully, through the interviews with these fantastic people we've got lined up, to consider other sources of income, other ways to make money as a teacher, ways to streamline what you already do, and just everything to do with business. So my guest today, really, really special guest, he is the CEO of Music Teachers Helper, and that's online scheduling and software um, technology for music teachers that I've recommended before. Um, it's a fantastic application, um, and I could talk about that, but today isn't actually about Music Teachers Helper. It's about the business side of things and what we can learn from someone like Brandon Pierce, who's my guest today. Now, before I go any further, I did want to thank today's sponsor, which is the Piano Teachers in a Circle. And most of you will go, oh, yeah, that's uh, that's your, <laughs> your community. And it is. Uh, so I am sponsoring my own podcast. But I wanted to do that today just to let you know of just how cool this community uh, has become and how big it's become. Um, the number of people in there is growing. And look, this is the place to be. Um, if you are truly passionate about piano teaching and you want to really make a difference in your students' lives and you're willing to help other teachers make a difference in their students' lives, uh, the kind of people that are in the inner circle at the moment are those who are really passionate, they're dedicated, they're committed to being the best they can be, uh, and they have a real strong drive to share with other people, and that's what the community is all about. So not only do you get access to all my resources and videos, uh, you know, teaching, watching me teach, using apps, all that kind of stuff, um, that's really only a small part of it. I mean, there, there's a lot in there, but, you know, resources are great. The thing that you will get by joining my inner circle is the community. Uh, so we've got a bustling community forum full of ideas and questions and great topics of conversation. Uh, and we also have our monthly mastermind online. So that's a chance to actually hang out with me, have a chat and the other members and share ideas, ask questions, all that kind of stuff. Look, guys, I don't want to tell you anymore. I want you to go to timtopham.com slash community if you haven't been there recently and had a look at the video and all the benefits and make sure you sign up while you can. This episode is also sponsored by the Forte School of Music. And many of you will know the founder and one of the directors of Forte from previous podcasts and a number of blogs on timtoppen.com, and that's Paul Myatt. So Forte School of Music has been a huge success story in Australia with around 4,000 students and schools in all major capital cities. They are currently looking for entrepreneurial music teachers who are interested in building a successful business in Australia or other countries with the opportunity to be the master franchisor in their territory. Forte schools can build to the size you're able to manage. Some schools are small with just a couple of hundred students, while others have nearly a thousand students and a million dollar turnover. The key to success after being in business for 22 years is quality, the courses and systems, but most importantly, the teachers who offer the pedagogically sound curriculum. To find out more about Forte, head to fortemusic.com.au slash business. Okay, so my guest today, Brandon, he uh, has been the CEO of Music Teachers Helper since it started. He actually founded it. And really, in about five or eight years, he went from a US, being a US piano teacher, uh, you know, a studio teacher just like most of us, uh, from that to living a very comfortable life, traveling the world all the year round with his family and working about six to eight hours a week, how good would that be, um, remotely on his business uh, and making enough money to live comfortably wherever he is in the world. It's a really inspiring story, and I know you're going to get a lot out of it. Uh, he's a fascinating person, and um, I hope it really is uh, a way that you can get inspired by the possibilities that can lie out there for you in the world using technology um, and 
And uh, yeah, let's get straight into it. Here is Brandon Pierce um, from Music Teachers Helper. Well, Brandon, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for joining me today. Thanks, Tim. Happy to be here. All right. So this is going to be this podcast is part of my business month at uh, timtopham.com. So it's about um, helping teachers sort of think more laterally, I guess, about how they can make more income from their piano teaching or whether they can do some other projects on the side or completely diversify their income. So the reason I wanted to get you on the show is you have an incredible story, um, which I think can be really inspiring for teachers. Um, and we'll talk about how you've kind of moved from being a teacher into being an entrepreneur. That's kind of the, the what you've what you've achieved but I guess I don't want to turn people off right from the beginning um, people that you know are really happy teaching their students um, so I wonder if um, you can give us your own kind of opinion about how um, entrepreneurial stories and inspirational kind of stories like what we're going to be talking about can help teachers even if they're kind of comfortable in their current situation Sure. Um, well, I think first uh, it's important for teachers to remember that, you know, as long as they're independent teachers and not working for a school or something, that uh, they are entrepreneurs already. Um, and when you see your your studio, see your, see your career from that vantage point, it kind of opens the door for other creative ways to earn income and, and to connect with your students. So uh, that's the first thing that I would say. And then, um, you know, the second is, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what, what teachers will get out of the podcast, but uh, uh, it'll probably be different for everybody in each situation. So I think, uh, but I think stories like this can help uh, teachers to, um, it gives it gives an opportunity to kind of look into yourself at what, um, you know, what you do enjoy. If, if you love teaching and that's what you want to do, then, you know, that's what you should do. But if, you know, you feel some kind of a longing to create a, a new kind of product around uh, around music teaching or even change your career entirely, uh, I think it's important to stay open to that as well. Mm, yeah, that's great. I, I think I've, I've really been pushing this kind of idea for piano teachers, or music teachers in general, to consider themselves, as you say, as business owners. They are their own CEOs of their enterprises. Um, and it's very easy to kind of downplay that, you know, oh, no, I'm just kind of, you know, running, I'm just doing a little studio in my in my back room or whatever sure. it is. It's, yep. it's kind of, it's almost hard, I think, to make that switch. But I'm really pushing teachers. And I think the more books I read about it, um, that are being put out at the moment for teachers the more I'm reading yeah th- this is the way that you have to think about things um, in order to to, uh, to I guess create a living that is sustainable which is ultimately definitely right. yeah right. So look, let's get into your story a little bit because um, it's fascinating can you tell us that moment when your journey to where you currently are actually began what was that catalyst and what is okay. it uh, what is it kind of where has it taken you in, in the short version because I know it's obviously we could talk about this for quite some time but all right <laughs> uh, sure well I was um, I was 22 or 23 uh, it was early 2002 or three I think it was I was teaching uh, music lessons piano lessons I had 10 students uh, and going to school to study computer programming I had a wife and a little baby I was uh, working full-time as an internet tech support rep, making $10 an hour, uh, just trying to, you know, make ends meet and keep up with, with the busyness of life. That is busy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a lot going on. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of a side project. Uh, well, my students would come to my lessons and ask, you know, how much do I owe you? And I would find uh, it, would, it, it would just kind of annoy me a little bit to have to take the time and to calculate up all right, how many lessons there were, when were the payments, and every, you know, it, during lesson time, it didn't seem like the best time for that. There's got to be a more efficient way uh, to do this. And so I just wrote a little program for me to help me keep track of that information. I would uh, input every lesson that the students had uh, and every payment they made, and then I could just check to see that the software would calculate how much the student owed at any given time. And you were able to do this because you were already a software programming you had coding skills is that right that's right i mean i i started programming when i was 12 so i i you know i knew a little bit but i was also going to college uh to lean lean toward that as a profession uh yeah. but also teaching on the side and yeah. and for any tech geeks out there what programming language were you using right at the beginning i was using php okay cool so it was a it was a web-based um it was all web yep yeah. right from the mm-hmm. start yeah great yes all right Back to you. Yeah, and so the other catalyst, though, to turn it into a business was that because um, I had no intention of 
uh, of making money with this. This is just a, a kind of a side project uh, for me. Um, but two things happened that really shifted it for me. One was my father-in-law, who was in the IT industry, lost his job. Uh, he hadn't done anything wrong, but um, I started to realize that there really is no such thing as job security when you work for somebody else. And I realized that I wanted more than that for my family. I wanted more security. Uh, and then second is that um, a friend suggested, well, why don't you turn this software project you've created into a business? And I realized that there were other teachers out there who, who were interested in what I was doing and, and it was really helpful for me. It was saving me a lot of time uh, and headache. And I had also, by that point, made it possible for students to log in from home, to check their schedules, mm -hmm. to make payments online. Uh, and it was just really convenient. And I was sending notes to the parents about how the lessons went. It was all automatic. Um, so I think yeah, teachers could probably benefit from this. I mean, I know I'm, I'm loving it. And so surely there's someone else out there who'd, who'd be interested too. So I decided to make it available for other teachers. How did you confirm the need that I mean, you could guess, as most people who would start a new product or sort of software would go, oh, I reckon other people would use this, but that's probably not enough to build a business on. How did you actually go about confirming with people, yes, yes, this is a thing we need, and yes, we will pay for it? You know, I didn't, actually. All oh, right. <laughs> uh, it was just, uh, I, well, first of all, I, I didn't, uh, unlike a lot of businesses where, you know, you have a, a huge expense to get started and a huge commitment, for me, it was just, I was the programmer. I was the only person doing it. I didn't have investors. I didn't, you know, make it a big deal. So if no one really wanted it, all I would be out is time. So there wasn't a huge risk for me. Mm. And also, I was just confident that, that teachers would uh, because cause I did. And the pe people I talked to uh, who were my, my music teacher colleagues all seemed confident that, that it would be useful. Okay, so when we, when did you make the step to um, actually sell? I assume you sold it to other people, or did you first kind of give it away to people to say, "Hey, what do you think about this?" I did, yeah, and and we had a, a free account. Well, we still do have a free plan as well, but uh, I mean, from the beginning, I was looking very actively for feedback on you know what can I do to make this better, and and how can I you know improve it to really serve teachers' needs more. So yeah, that was that was always part yeah. of it. So you shared it with people, got their feedback, and, and then obviously realized, well, hey, this is actually pretty serious. Uh, this is something that people want. Maybe I could make a business out of it. How did you know when it was that kind of point? Because there must come a point where you're, you know, you're doing these three jobs and you're, and you're a parent, and then it must kind of tip over at some point and you go, all right, I'm, I'm going to go, go for this. What, what, what was that? How did that work? Um, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but uh, when my first customer paid me, that's right. that was probably the time like, this is it! <laughs> Someone's willing to pay for it! <laughs> it must be a great idea! So, um, you know, I wanted to put more effort into it at that point. It became really exciting for me, a real passion project. Um, unfortunately, I was too busy to do a whole lot with it. So, I mean, I was yeah, going to school and working full-time and all of that, so every waking moment for the next oh, four or five years was spent on building music teachers helper. I'd get up early, I'd spend all my lunch breaks on it, I'd stay up late at night, it was consuming everything. But it was fun. Okay, so probably from you know, starting, starting to make the, uh, the website yourself, or the product mm -hmm. for yourself, to, to actually kind of putting it out there as a paid product to the general public, how many mm -hmm. year, how many years would that have taken? Um, from initial conception to launching it as a business, I think about two years. But again, that's because it's very part time. I was just playing around for most of it, and yeah, I I could have launched it much quicker, of course, if if that was my initial intent. Do you think um, a teacher out there who has a good job, uh, sorry, a good idea for a another piece of software, could have the same kind of result without being a programmer and paying someone to do it? Or does that put it, is that a very different kind of proposition? Um, I mean, it depends on the situation and the product and everything. Um, I mean, there are a lot of people who create software businesses who aren't programmers, of course. Um, I also think programming is a skill that uh, most people can learn pretty easily. If you go to a site like codeacademy.com, you can learn for free very quickly. Um, is that but, yeah, genuinely software, quickly or... 
Like, because uh, I mean, I, I, well, look, at, I look at the, the code on my website and go, oh <laughs> my goodness, I've got little ideas, but <laughs> far out. I guess it depends on how much you enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, but, and how much time you have to put into it. But I'd say over the course of a few months, you can get a pretty good handle on, on basic programming. Okay. But uh, it's also possible to hire out programmers for, uh, for reasonable amounts. So, uh, you know, especially if you, if you hire somebody in Eastern Europe or the Philippines or something like that where the costs are a lot lower, mm. uh, it's, it's easier to, to find help that way. Mm. I mean, I just think it's an exciting thing being, you know, creative, developing a venture, uh, particularly when I guess you've developed it for yourself initially. Uh, and I know uh, there's a lot of products and websites that start that way. I'm solving a problem for myself and oh, by the way, I think a whole lot of other people might like this too. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting concept for other teachers to, to not necessarily consider, you know, completely changing their life and quitting their job or all this kind of stuff. But, but just to think, you know, maybe it's not a website for them to start, but maybe it's, um, you know, starting to sell some of their worksheets online on Teachers Pay Teachers or something like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, what other skills did you need apart from coding um, in the last, maybe in the, over the last five years or so of the growth of the business, what other skills have mm. you required um, to develop the business? Yeah, well, I mean, when I started, I knew nothing about business, um, knew nothing about marketing or sales, or I did know customer support pretty well because of, of my experience in, in uh, tech support. But um, yeah, I mean, I've had to learn a lot of uh, a lot of that. I, I, I mean, I did all the graphics design, I uh, did all the the marketing, the the yeah, all of those those typical business skills. I had to learn uh, as well as management. Now that uh, we have over twenty employees uh, in the business, so learning to to work as a team and to you know set vision and to delegate and to um, yeah, all those things have been important skills to learn. Yeah, that I never thought I would. <laughs> I would keep picking up like this. Um, how did you go about promoting Music Teachers Helper in the early days? Um, it was a lot of trial and error. Uh, I I designed really ugly uh, flyers. <laughs> 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 Looking back, I think they're ugly. Uh, that I, I put up in music stores or uh, different places. Um, we did go to some music teacher. I, I went to some music teacher conferences uh, locally and and nationally, which were helpful. To set up a booth and, and talk to teachers that way. Uh, a little bit of online advertising, uh, magazines, which were not very uh, successful, uh, probably because it's an online product. Um, but I think. By far, the biggest source of new teachers has always been word of mouth referrals. Mm. So teachers would use it, like it, share it with their friends who would use it and like it and share it. Mm. Uh, and that's to this day how we still get most of our customers. Yep. And what did you, when you first started, what, what did it cost uh, for teachers to use? Um, it, I think it was seven ninety five a month uh, for 10 students. Okay. So now we're at... Uh, Fourteen dollars a month for twenty students. Uh, we also had a free plan up to three students. Now we're up to five, um, and the maximum plan now is uh, forty nine dollars a month for unlimited students. And there's several tiers in between. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, the product was a lot different back then as well. It was really basic. Uh, it just did you know basic scheduling and billing. Now we have automatic invoicing and. Uh, online payments and practice log and a repertoire tracker and a lending library and a mileage tracker and income and expense reports everything you need to you yeah. know to manage your studio and I love that it keeps iterating too I, I keep getting uh, you know emails about a new feature that's been added and I think I think that's great you know you're not charging us extra for it it's just like you know here's part of the deal we've we've upgraded the software here's another thing, cool thing that you can use I think I think that's a great way to run it too um, Thank what? you. Yeah, this year this year is going to be huge with uh, with new features. We've been Ooh, yeah, making a major shift. We just just this, side scoop a little bit. Sure. Uh, I mean, this week we just launched a new design, which was is going to be the foundation for uh, all of the new work that we're putting on this year. That we've been really working for the past year and a half at behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, this new design now is because the software is eleven years old. We've done several. Uh, redesigns and updates over the years but um, it's been a few years since the last one so now we're, we're completely responsive and it works great on all devices tablets phones um, and 
So the next step is to gradually um, replace pretty much every part of the program with uh, newly, freshly designed um, aspects that take into account um, really what teachers are trying to do with the software and also in their studios in general. So I, I sent out a survey um, <coughs> Excuse me. a couple of years ago now, I think, maybe not that long, uh, really trying to get an idea for what teachers you know, what teachers' needs were. I mean, we had been in, in business for almost 10 years at that point, and um, I, I was feeling like the software was, was great, and it was serving a lot of people that I knew there was more that we could do and, to make it better. And so I, I was asking questions like, you know, what, what are we doing well? What are we not doing well? Um, what, what are the major challenges you have in teaching, in your teaching studio in general, outside of even the software and what we're doing, um, and what can we help with? And I was really touched by the responses that came back. People were really vulnerable and uh, shared some really great uh, insights that helped us in shaping the product for this year. So, um, can you give us I an I example of one of those one of those insights <laughs> or one of the yeah, things that's so, led to change? Sure. Um, yeah, invoicing, for example, um, we're doing it very simply now, uh, and it will continue to be simple. But I guess. It, that's a good example of this uh, because every single part of the software is changing. Right. But, uh, invoicing uh, is going to be more, um, how can I say it? Simple, more simple, but also more powerful. So, okay. uh, easier, to use, <laughs> easier to use, but uh, more functionality somehow. Is that that's kind of the thing? Yeah, and, and more just... There are ways that it works now in which um, it's harder to tell what is going in the invoice. So this new system will allow teachers to know exactly what is going to be showing on every single invoice at any time and, um, and exactly when they're going out. Everything will be able to be, to be previewed and, and easier to pull in specific transactions, easier to handle taxes in different countries, all sorts of different things. Uh, everything that, any, that the teachers have requested over the past 10 years that they wanted in the invoicing system, we're putting it in now. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're finally getting, you know, you, 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 as you iterate and improve, you're, just, you're adding all these features that you know teachers want because you've surveyed them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. It's really good. I, I want to come back to the business in a second, but just looking at this from an outside perspective almost, um, you, you should probably tell everyone a little bit about actually how you spend your life these days because mm. you're obviously very connected to the business, but people might not know that you're actually not sitting in an office every day as well. Mm. So tell us a little bit about your current lifestyle because I think it's fascinating. Sure. Uh, let me back up just a little bit because, um, I mean, for the first five or six years of building the business, I was working yeah, 70 to 80 hour weeks building it. Uh, and um, it, was, it wasn't until 2008 or nine where I was making enough to where I felt comfortable to quit my job and then do Music Teachers Helper full time. And How many years after that was, after you started, was that, that you went that was about quit my job? four or five years. Okay. So it took a long time to get to that point, again, because it was all, with the meager hours I could scrape together and, <laughs> and with my very limited experience. Yep. Um, so, and I, I think at that point I was still only making about $1,500 a month with Music Teacher's Helper. Mm -hmm. So it, it took a long time to take off. Um, but after that point, um, yeah, I was able to put much more effort into it and started earning enough that I could hire help. And, and it, it really started taking off at that point. So now, uh, you know, thir tw 12 years after the business started, uh, I am traveling with my family around the world, uh, working from wherever I happen to be. Uh, all our employees also, we don't have a central office, we're an online company, so all of my employees uh, work from wherever they're at as well. Um, most of our, uh, all of our management and so most of our support is in the States. We have some programmers in the Philippines and Eastern Europe, um, but we're pretty global. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I sometimes work on the couch, sometimes on the bed, sometimes in an office if I have one. Don't um, tell me sometimes in a hammock on the beach. 
That'll be the next one. <laughs> you know, that doesn't really work so well with all the sand and the sun. <laughs> it looks good in photos, doesn't it? That's right. It looks good in photos. <laughs> how, do you, um, how, do you, uh, how do your staff all talk, uh, communicate when they're in different time zones in different parts of the world? Uh, I, I imagine communication can be, could be quite difficult. Have you got tools for that? Yeah, mostly we use email. Uh, I mean, that's always been my go-to, but we've also, we also started using a program called bitrix24.com, which is kind of a social intranet uh, where we can all chat together as a team and, and communicate that way. Mm. Um, and yeah, time zone wise, yeah, sometimes people stay up later or earlier and we, we just work it out, but uh, yeah. It works, yeah. It's, it works, yeah. And, now you've and got- I mean, my managers with their teams often have, you know, Skype chats and group meetings and stuff like that online yeah. as well. So yes, yeah, so you obviously don't have to have all twenty people t- together at, at once online. No, and we typically don't. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, now you've got three kids, don't you? Three young mm-hmm. children. Yep. So I'm really interested. I mean, it sounds like the ultimate lifestyle: traveling the world, um, exploring. Um, but when you've got kids with you, uh, this becomes a little bit more complex. So I'm really interested in how you go about educating your children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, one of the reasons we started traveling is because of, of the kids and we wanted to give them an experience that was different from uh, the kind of bubble that, that we feel we grew up in and wanted to expand, learn new languages, experience other cultures. And, and so we don't really follow a set curriculum in how we educate our kids. We, so you're, you're, uh, you're homeschool in inverted commas, you teach them yourself. Uh, actually, not even that. Uh, <laughs> we we more follow kind of an unschooling approach where we we support the kids in pursuing the things that they're interested in. So we don't um, we don't teach them necessarily. I mean, we do. We learn together, uh, and we we provide tools and resources for them to um, go down the avenues that they want. So, for example, my my oldest is twelve, and she uh, is very passionate about music, which kind of makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so she's uh, taking singing and songwriting lessons from a professional songwriter in LA, and online, she's of course. Been online yep, yeah. through Skype, yeah. <laughs> and she's uh, she's released her first two singles this week, uh, oh, good which on is it. exciting. Yeah, and she's also taking dance lessons online, Irish dance, and um, we also take advantage of local classes wherever we're at. So my middle daughter is ten, and she's in a gymnastics class here in, in Nelson, New Zealand, where we're at at the moment. And uh, we'll be here for the next three months. Okay. Um, so you do so things you like put that. Your then they down use... for a few months at a time. Do you tend to? We do. Yeah. If 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 it's 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 a lot less expensive that way. First of all, and then it allows us to integrate more into the community and get into routines and, and get some creative work done. Hmm. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, we we would get burned out really quick if we're just constantly sightseeing or, yeah, you know, that type absolutely. of travel that most people do in the two-week vacation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you keep... Um, so we're more living parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any concerns about when your kids... I mean, I assume you'll base yourself somewhere eventually, um, or maybe not. Um, but, you know, <laughs> if, if, if your kids want to go to university, for example, um, how are they going to have the qualifications or pass the exams that they need to to do that if they want to? Yeah, um, I'm not too worried about that because um, mainly what we're teaching our kids, if we're teaching them anything, is how to learn. And um, I mean, my oldest is so proactive. She knows more than I do about a whole lot of things um, through the internet. Through And, and they're also, I, I forgot to mention, they use websites like Khan Academy, <clears throat> which is has tons of videos for math and That's Khan, uh, science. Um, and also K- K-H-A-N. Mm-hmm. Academy.com, all right? That's right. Uh, lots of websites like that, but um, fantastic resources for learning just about anything. And I think, I mean, the world is really a lot different than it was when I was going to school. I mean, you can learn anything now pretty much for free on the Internet. Um, so there, there isn't really as much value. I mean, there, there is still, a, and if you have a really good teacher who's, who can, can inspire you and, and can consolidate important information that you want to learn. But I feel like so much of what I learned in school was, uh, was kind of busy work and stuff that I wasn't very interested in at all and just memorized for a test and then forgot and kind of a waste of time in a lot of ways, even up through college. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, internationally, there are a lot of universities that make it easy to enter uh, and, and that are a lot more affordable than the States. So uh, wherever they decide 
to go whatever they decide to do, I'm supportive of as well as an entrepreneurial lifestyle. Even if they decide they don't want to go to college, I'm okay with that too, uh, because I realized that it wasn't essential for me and in, in my business during this type of living yeah. lifestyle. So, uh, but it depends on what they want to go into. Sometimes a degree is necessary. So, yeah, it's a very progressive view of uh, of bringing up your children. I think. I, I, Isn't I, it? Yeah. I, I think. I think it's great. But you must you must get a fair few people going. You're bad. You're mad. Uh, yeah. Or, or you're, you know, this is so wrong. Your children are missing out, or whatever. Um, how do you, how do you cope with people that give you those kind of reactions, or you know, you're just confident in in your own children and how you run things. It's okay. You know, I mean, I I do have doubts at times, and 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 we're open to exploring other avenues. We've we've put our kids in school for a month or two here and there in different places, and they they've decided it's not really for them, but. Um, Maybe later they'll change as they yeah. get older as well. So it it just depends. We're totally open to other mm. to other ways, and I think what works for one family doesn't always work for another. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that this is the only way everyone should do yeah. things. <laughs> no, <I'm, laughs> but it definitely works for us. I'm fascinated by it because there's a lot of educational research out there that that says exactly what you've done. That, that said, in that a lot of schoolwork, a lot of schoolwork is busy work, um, and a lot of it really isn't relevant to the 21st century job. Um, market um, and you know kids would be far more successful if they just learned some coding for example because everything's going to be coded if they you know learn some skills about problem solving creativity and how to learn uh, it would be just as effective I've read plenty of articles that say that so, so I think I, I give you kudos for, for trying it out with your own children it's it's almost a case study or a book in itself I think potentially down the track yeah yeah and you know it's interesting we've been to several unschooling conferences where we've seen a lot of people who have been raised like this up through adulthood and they're doing great they're, the, the thing that I I also want for my kids is not for them to just get stuck into a job that they don't like and feeling like they're in a rut but to really be doing something where they where they love it and feel like they're making a valuable contribution uh, to the world and um, having the flexibility to adapt and to listen to themselves and what they want and, and not just do what they're told to do because they think they're supposed to do it, uh, which is how the school system is kind of set up. Mm. Uh, yeah. All right. I just want to go back to the business. A, a few more questions about that. Um, one in particular is in regard to staff. Um, you say they're all over the world, which you, which is kind of the modern way things are happening. And in actual fact, I've got help in different countries for my blog and different aspects of, of that and my uploading mm-hmm. podcasts like this and things. Um, I wonder for, for teachers who might be listening, um, you know, you don't have to have a business to hire a little bit of help from overseas potentially. Um, yeah. So what are, what are some things that teachers could potentially use uh, what we call a virtual assistant for in another country, do you think? Uh, do you think that's that's uh, something that teachers could do? Definitely. Um, and it doesn't even have to be in another country. It could be the same. I have a, a virtual assistant in the States at the moment she, who's extremely helpful for me. In uh, work, uh, And I guess as a, I, I need to think as, you know, as a music teacher what would be useful. But um, uh, <laughs> it's funny, I could almost put a plug in for my business here because <laughs> we've designed it in a way to, to you know, be kind of an assistant to, to music teachers uh, without having to, you know, pay for Hire an actual someone. person. But yep. yes, but there are still things, uh, I think, beyond that that could probably, you could probably mm. use, use help with. Uh, or even just taking care of some of the, the data entry into the software or... Um, you know, making calls to students for different aspects of things or collecting payments if there are, you know, issues with that. Um, yeah, so I'm thinking about time. I mean, my own timetabling, for example, um, I, I, we have, I, I teach at a school and we have a confusing system of uh, rotating timetables over two oh, periods right. yes. and things like that. Um, and I've talked to some of your guys about it and it's not quite something that um, music teacher can do it's it's because it's very complex and there's lots of ifs and buts and it, it, it at the moment I can't think of a way to automate it particularly well but there's aspects of the data entry that um, could easily be done by someone in another country for example mm-hmm. um, so you know I, I guess for for teachers listening I'd say you know if, if there are mundane repetitive things that you could easily ask someone else to do and pay them to do that to give you more time to be creative or to explore new repertoire or something like that, then consider it because it's not necessarily that expensive. Um, and if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you often have to do this, um, you could set up a little video about how you do it, how you want it done, mm-hmm. and then they can just go off and do it. Um, how do and you I would f- even say, 
uh, before we move on from that is, uh, you know, even not in your business, but in your personal life, there are a lot of things that you can automate as well that, that, that save time, whether it's uh, mm-hmm. some cities have, have websites, people who can run errands for you or, uh, you know, it, I've used a site called fancyhands.com for a lot of online research tasks and making phone calls to take care of different things. Uh, very inexpensive. Uh, I think it was like $25 a month and you get five or ten tasks or something like that. Um, or, you know, going to sites like upwork.com to to look for, for people in different countries or all over the world for, for pretty much anything you want to hire out. Yeah. Uh, you can find it. Yep, yep. A new logo for your studio. If you know, if you want to get something more professional done than you could do yourself, you know, there, there's, mm. there's so many opportunities out there. Um, I think another site that I used when I began was Fiverr, f i v e r r dot com, which is a great site where most of the gigs, well, they were five dollars. I don't think they are anymore, but <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the idea of the site. You know, you pay five bucks and you get one logo designed and, and things like that. Um, so I really want to kind of just broaden all the viewers. Um, notions of how you can use this um, integrated international world now of people in these other countries um, for whom five to ten dollars an hour is a a top wage Um, you know you can not only get great work done for yourself you can be supporting other people in other countries I I think it's great and Upwork is where I I go as well upwork.com to find people so um, but I, what yeah. was the hands, the fancy hands or something? Fancyhands.com, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. We'll put a link to that in the show notes for sure. Okay. Um, okay. Now, I just want to get on to making money, right? Um, I think for a lot of teachers, uh, not just music either, just teachers generally, making money is almost a dirty word. Um, mm. You know, or, almost like we should be a community service. We don't want to ask for, you know, we almost don't want to ask for payment. Um and so I guess my question for you is, did you ever feel this way when you're establishing and you're building, your business was starting to grow? Um, and what would you say to teachers who might be feeling the same way? Yeah, that is a mindset that I grew up with. And uh, yeah, thinking that, that yeah, money is a dirty word and uh, definitely. Um, and it's, it's taken a long time for me to gradually overcome that. Um, I think, I mean, now I see money um, more as a neutral uh, unit of exchange, um, and and kind of an indicator of value. So as I mean, we we all spend money on the things that that we value. So uh, if you're creating something that is valuable, somebody will who also values that will pay you money for it. And I think there, you know, if you're creating something that's really valuable, then someone will pay you a lot of money for it. And I think there should be no guilt uh, or shame in in that exchange. Um, it's it's just an indicator that what you're doing is, is valuable. Now, I mean, there are, uh, of course, you know, people who you've got to... Ignore that. Ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, there are, you know, I, I do think there's there's something maybe detrimental in, you know, pursuing money just for money's sake um, and, and over, you know, the idea of, of value or of contribution. But I think when your focus is on creating the value rather than just creating money. Um, I think the money tends to flow into that. So that's how I tend to view it. Um, I, I, I do enjoy, um, you know, having enough money to sustain my family and to do the things that I love and that, you know, having enough of that and a little bit more also allows me to create other products and to contribute in other ways that I otherwise wouldn't be able to if I were, um, we're not valuing what I did highly. And I think, I think for music teachers that, that also is something to consider is, um, you know, how much do you value what you're offering? Are you worth $10 an hour? And, you know, not, you know, I, I don't really want to promote myself because, you know, no one's really going to want it. Or, or, you know, are you worth $150 an hour lesson because what you do is changing people's lives and it's really making the world a better place. And I mean, anything within that range, d- determine what you're worth and confidently stick to that and 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 then if there will be other people who can see that around you that you are really are contributing that much value and they'll be willing to to do that exchange with you Mm. Uh, that's that's my take yeah and i I imagine teachers would agree with that but then say uh actually i'm living in an area where there's you know two people down the road charging twenty dollars for a half hour lesson 
Um, I think I'm worth fifty dollars for a half hour lesson, uh, but how do I how do I compete? What would you say to that? I would say first of all, get clear on what you offer that the other teacher doesn't, and and be creative about how you can expand your your studio. Uh, I would also say, don't just consider the local market; consider global the global market. You have people all over the world open to you to teach to through through lessons online. Uh, and some of them in, in very wealthy countries and areas that have a lot, uh, lot higher budgets and a lot higher uh, idea of what music lessons are worth. Um, and, and thirdly, there are a lot of other ways to supplement your income besides teaching. You could do you know, group lessons and workshops and retreats and uh, all sorts of different things. Yeah. And that's, so and that's, that would... yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great, Brandon. And, and uh, there's some of the, you know, some of the ideas we're going to be exploring and have been exploring um, <clears throat> when this podcast goes live in the business month, because um, I, I want to sort of share some of these ideas as there's, there's great ways that you can increase your income as a, as a music teacher without spending more time potentially um, by, you know, doing events or special recitals or group teaching or whatever it is. So um, I, I think you're absolutely right on the money with that. So look, I'm also quite passionate about helping students um, make informed decisions about the reality of a music career. Do you think as teachers, we tend to give students the skills they need for, um, for the reality of a career in music if that's what they're interested in? Do we kind of give them the skills that they need or do we often not look far enough in the future for our students, do you think? Hmm. Well, I guess it depends on, you know, the goals of the student. Um, do they want to be a professional musician and, you know, be in a, a famous orchestra or band or, um, you know, have a solo career or whatever? Uh, if so, then the skill set they're going to need is, is a lot different, I think, than, than what a lot of uh, music teachers offer. I think it's hard to know what to share with that unless you've actually had that kind of experience yourself. It almost takes a professional musician in order to teach those skills. Mm. Um, so I don't know. Uh, you know, this stuff. is, this is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I would say, um, I mean, there are some really good books out there that, that also help with that for, you know, for students that are interested and maybe teachers can use those as resources. Um, what is it? Everything you need to know about the music industry. I can't remember what it's called. There's <laughs> some really good book out there about that. Uh, I can share it maybe, with you later. If you yeah, maybe if, if you can remember it and just shoot me an email, I'll pop it in the notes. Okay. That, that, that would be sure. Great. I mean, any book recommendations, um, I think, are fantastic. You know, I would also highly recommend The Savvy Music Teacher by David Cutler. Yeah. Um, fantastic book for, for earning uh, income in different ways as, uh, as a music teacher. Yeah. In fact, I think, I think I've got, got my copy right here. That's like, it, it is... It is such such a good book. I'm going to be blogging about it more and more um, in the coming um, coming year. I mean, this this actually I think is one of the best books that that have come out in regard to to helping music teachers uh, make more money effectively. I guess, but you know, but doing it in a way that's really really achievable. I think it's yeah. I mean, so such a good book and well timed as well. Yeah, it's so practical too. It really gets yes. into the, the details. Mm. There's one other book that I would recommend that's not uh, specific to the music industry, but just more uh, about money in general, overcoming that that uh, money is bad mindset. Uh, it's called The Soul of Money, uh, written by Lynn Twist. And it's a, it's a fantastic book. She spent time with uh, tribes in the Amazon and um, CEOs of billion dollar companies and uh, really did a lot of research into, um, you know, money and how it operates and what it's for and, and how to use it in, in ways that really serve. Mm. Highly yeah. recommend that. Great. All right. So look, we'll kind of start wrapping it up a little bit. I've got just a few more questions for you. Um, if there are some teachers out there watching who are like, wow, I, I, I totally wish I could do that. Mm-hmm. What, um, where could they start on this process? How could they kind of get an idea or, or begin sort of diversifying themselves potentially, uh, you know, where, where would you actually just make your first step? What direction would you go? Hmm. Um, well, I guess it depends on what specifically they want to do. If it's, um, you know, creating a valuable product that, you know, is serving a need, um, then I would 
come up with ideas for, you know, I, I look in your own life, you know, what, what annoys you, what, uh, you know, what, what in your life do you see that could be more efficient or done better or what, what do you, needs do you have that aren't being served and then come up with a solution for that and then offer it to others. That would be uh, first step there. If your goal is to travel the world long term, <laughs> uh, I don't think you necessarily need to have an online business to do that. Well, I mean, you could transition to online lessons and, and then work from anywhere, pretty much. But I think there's also a misconception that travel has to be very expensive. We tend to think in terms of uh, of luxury two week vacations, but um, I mean, if you if you move to Costa Rica, for example, or, or Bali, you know. Um, you can and, and, and rent a place for a year. Uh, I mean, it's so much less expensive to your money goes so much farther in places like that than it does in, in the Western world. And if you're traveling, um, you don't have a house back home to look after or worry about too. I assume you. That's right. You know, you, you're like, no, what we have is is what we've got. Yeah, we sold our house and, and pretty much everything. We just travel with uh, with carry on luggage. <laughs> <laughs> it's really um, amazing. It's quite mind blowing. I, I'm sure some people's minds will be totally blown by this episode. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people though too. They they rent out their homes <clears throat> while while they travel. And that that can help fund your travels in itself. Um, so yeah, there's Airbnb and uh, or even a long term rental hiring a property management company to take care of it. They take eight to ten percent, and then uh, the rest you can you can use to to live and you don't have to worry about so, it which is pretty cool you don't have to worry. yeah now i'm a big fan of uh there's a book by a guy called tim ferris which we'll put a link to on the uh show notes called the four hour work week um and i was so um impressed to see that you were listed your you were listed as a case study on his blog and for those of you who don't know tim ferris um he's internationally renowned for this book it's an amazon um and new york times i think bestseller how did you mm-hmm. get to be on that blog how did that happen yeah, there's actually um, two places that he uh, referenced me on the blog. Uh, the first was um, a case study about Music Teacher's Helper, where uh, I think he had asked for example case studies or something, and I submitted mine just to see what would happen, uh, and that got chosen. Uh, but then later, uh, I got contacted by his assistant, who uh, saw a post on my blog that I'd written entitled, How I Spend My Time Now. And I had uh, tracked every second of every day uh, for an entire week, and, and categorized everything that I did. Um, I think just I try to help. That, actually, <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> I wanted to see if you know how I was spending my time was really matching my values and and just uh, if it was efficient. And it turned out that that week I had worked uh, uh, on income producing activities about seven hours, and I think he, you know, he likes that idea and. Uh, so I wanted to, to showcase that on, on the blog. So I, I, he guest posted that blog post on his blog. Got it. Yeah. Did that surprise you when you worked out that it was about seven or eight hours worth of work in one week? No, that's, that's actually pretty typical for me now. Um, I mean, as a CEO, my, my job is to set the vision for the company and, uh, and to you know, determine what, how we're going to go and make sure things are really working well. But uh, I mean, I have a great team management and staff to carry that out. So, yeah, so I don't need to put a whole lot of effort into it anymore. I mean, it's a lot of effort, but it's not a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it sounds fantastic. All right, so let's look back. Um, what, was, what was probably the hardest time in this process for you, the one that caused the most kind of sleepless nights? Um, man, I mean, it was really hard in the beginning, Um and time consuming, but it was also really fun and, and challenging. So I don't know that I would consider that um, such a hard time. I think probably um, it was after I had already uh, made it, you know, you could say I went to, um, I'd sold my house, I quit my job, we were making enough money, I was traveling the world, um, working just a few hours a week on the business, but uh, I was kind of burned out on it. Uh, I had, I mean, I had put in so much time and so much focus, and so much energy, and over so many years that I was just kind of like, uh-huh. okay, I'm done for a while. And I almost considered selling it. Um, well, I did consider it. I didn't look into it very heavily. Um, but so, so there was a period of, of a good year or two where I didn't really give. I just kind of like, yeah, yeah, well. Let it, let it keep growing. And my team w- was doing a great job with it and all, but I wasn't putting a lot of focus or, or energy into it. And uh, it was 
it, it just wasn't exciting me and it felt more heavy than not the, all the responsibility. Mm. Um, but then over time I just realized that, you know what, a lot of what I've got here isn't, uh, I mean, I could be doing so much more to, to serve teachers and so I'm uh, creating so much more value out of this. And that's when I sent out the survey and, um, and then from there things started spiraling and, and I got more excited about it again. Yeah. So, um, that was, that was that a hard period. A hard period. Yeah. And it just sounds like pure burnout really. It was. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm glad you got it back, got your mojo back. <laughs> Thank you, me too. <laughs> can, you, can you give us um, just one or two business mistakes that you made that we could spare other teachers who, if they're interested in, in a money-making venture like this, who we could help them avoid? Um, you know, I tend to see mistakes as learning experiences. So uh, I would encourage all the teachers out there to make as many mistakes as you possibly can. <laughs> well said, well said. <laughs> and, uh, and then go from there, yeah. Um, yeah, looking back, it's, it's hard to really identify major mistakes because they all turned into to learning experiences and, and there weren't really any major ones. I mean, I, I sent emails when I, you know, to the wrong people or I hired people that didn't turn out to work out so well or expend money on things that ended up being a waste, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, you, learned, are you good. learned from it anyway. I learned from them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no one else can make your mistakes for you. Right. And you got to do it yourself. That's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Brandon, what's, what's next for you? What's the next big um, project? It, yeah. Uh, besides continuing to expand music teachers, helper, um, and studio helper, which is, um, a program that I wrote to help uh, music teachers. Say, what we, we had a lot of music teachers who were growing their studios and adding additional teachers to help with the student load and, and kind of uh, doing a multi, multi-teacher multi studio route. Uh, so we created another piece of software to help them manage their studios and also made it more general so it works with dance and yoga and art and, and other things. So um, expanding these two is, is major right now, but also... Um, I'm working on a family travel resource guide, uh, just kind of sharing all of the, the knowledge and, and tips we've learned over the past five years, five, six years of, of traveling the world in different places, uh, how to do it affordably and, um, you know, how to find accommodations and go to, you know, what, what places are going to work best for new travelers. Um, how to do it with a family, I imagine. How to do it with a family, yeah, luggage. Uh, all sorts of all the questions that everyone always asks of how how can you do this? Yeah. Um, we're answering in that in that guide. So. Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. All right. So, um, where where can people find out more about you? Yeah, um, I write on pierceonearth.com, P-E-A-R-C-E, on earth dot com at uh, our personal our family travel blog. I write about travel and entrepreneurship and. Uh, You've, you've got a some bit of fascinating music. articles um, on there. I've, I've been absorbed and lost for a little while on your, your site. Um, <laughs> cool, I, was, I, I particularly, uh, I was interested in some of your spirituality stories, um, why you left your church and all this. I, I thought it was, there was some really interesting stuff on there. I highly recommend people checking yeah. it out. Yeah, thanks. Please do. Yeah. yeah. If you, and if you feel free to send me an email too, I'm, I'm open to, to communication with anyone if you have questions. Oh, about anything just yeah. just want to chat so. okay fantastic well I'll pop um, are you happy for well you can do it two ways people could either comment on the show notes page and I could just um, send you them through when they come through or we could pop your email down there totally up to you okay sure I'll um, we'll, we'll uh, confirm it afterwards if you want okay sounds yeah, good cool um, and obviously people um, interested actually I should say too you've got your the studio studio t- what was the other web- studio helper studiohelper.com so that's for teachers who are running multi teacher studios and I just thought I'd put a plug in uh, my episode 7 of the podcast um, was how to build a multi teacher studio with uh, one of my friends from Adelaide who's done that very successfully here so if anyone is interested in that um, episode 7 uh, is the one to listen to um, and your software the one to look at if, you're, uh, if you've got other teachers with you um, and look the, the best place to grab music teachers helper is Um, using my code Um, so if you go to timtopham.com forward slash mth um, that'll actually get you 10% off for life um, through that code um, which uh, you'll uh, I've actually shared on a number of sort of podcasts and things Um, but uh, yeah that's that gets you a free day free free 30-day trial and 10% off uh, forever which is pretty good deal so 
There we go. Now, Brendan, is there anything that um, I should have asked you that we've kind of skipped over in regard to this whole idea of kind of inspiring teachers to look outside the studio for, for income and that sort of thing? Mm. I think we've covered it pretty well. Uh, the only thing that I would, you know, reiterate is I think one of the one of the most necessary skills if you do plan to create a, a business or go into uh, you know, some kind of other product is persistence, dedication, and patience. Um, a lot of people think that, well, I just I'll create this you know app in a month and then I'll launch it and in six months we'll I'll be rich. Uh, it doesn't work like that <laughs> for most people. Um, and it's, it's a lot of hard work, so be prepared for it. And, um, but it is, for me, it's been completely worth all of the efforts to, to put in. Uh, I love hearing back from teachers who are using my product saying things like, um, you know, this is what I've been looking for my entire teaching career, or, you know, this has saved my business and my love for what I do. Um, and it just, it inspires me, um, and helps me feel, um, like what I'm doing is 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 really valuable and, and providing a uh, useful service in the world. So it's yeah. motivating. That kind of motivation is what keeps me going and focusing on that, that you know, uh, helps me through the hard times. Yeah. And I can share a synergy with that and the work that I'm doing on the blog and the podcast. Uh, you know, the, yep. every email that I get or review that I get uh, that's kind of thankful and, and supportive, yeah, it does. It gives you a real boost. And makes the yeah. hours that you put in worth it. Yeah. So that's great. Well, what a great way to finish. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for your time. I'll let you go and enjoy the, the beach or whatever's happening in um, New Zealand. Today. <laughs> I'll be on the computer today. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. <laughs> no worries. Great to see you. Speak to you soon. All right. You too. Bye. Bye. If the idea of a piano teacher's community where you get to access the best educational resources, rub shoulders with expert teachers from around the world, and have immediate access to feedback for any of your questions, then Inner Circle membership is for you. The Inner Circle is my private community of piano teachers from across the globe who share a commitment to creating and delivering the most inspiring, modern, and progressive learning experiences for their students. Membership is now open, so head to timtopham.com forward slash community to find out more and get involved today. I can't wait to see you on the inside.